And so, look. Has it been established that none of us have trust funds? Did yeah, Brandon go through our financials? Yeah, does anyone have a trust no, fund? Be no. Okay, I don't either. If I do, I would but, love to find yeah, out. Yeah, not, uh, not turning anyone down. Yeah, is there ever like funds. an accidental trust fund situation? Like I keep you... hoping that one day I'm going to wake up and find like a letter about an obscure relative exactly. that died and bequeathed yeah. me a large amount of money, but that has yet to happen. Yeah, and look, if you have a trust fund, we're not angry about it. Just talk to us afterwards because we'd love to be yeah, a part I, of that. I would <laughs> but, love to uh, just touch base. <laughs> but I think really the point of this, you know, I mean, look, it's a funny title. And really when we were sent an email about this panel, that was kind of the joke. And we were all kind of like, you know, actually, that's a great title. Because it's true. I mean, it's a different situation if you already have the money and that's kind of where you're coming from. But we want to sort of approach things from the angle of how do you make things by any means necessary? How do you make a career for yourself, a name for yourself by making the film that is unique to you and, and uh, with the resources that are available to you, sometimes with no budget starting out, and then maybe slowly, hopefully, growing a career out of that um, by telling your story, your original story that is yours and only yours. So um, I think we sort of have this in common here. So I'd just like for each of you, and I also want to invite the audience if you, look, you know, if you want to ask a question at any point, just raise your hand. If we don't want to take questions at that point, we won't uh, allow it, but we would love to just make this a great dialogue. So we'd love for you to be a part of it. Um, so let's just start, um, Michael, with you. Just okay. let's, let's talk about our first films and kind of how those got made. You know, yep. it's like we, can, we don't have to go into too much detail. Let's kind of just give a brief of like how we got into this industry. Yeah, um, okay, so um, I'm actually the, uh, it's funny, uh, so I'm the opposite of what you said. Um, I did not start from a micro budget place. I didn't, I, I in my life never, uh, the most money I ever had in my bank account was like $1,400 and then rent came and it went back to zero again. <laughs> so there was no like, you know, small amount of money around for me to like make a micro budget film. I also wasn't honestly confident in my abilities as a director to make a micro budget film. Uh, so I, I got out of film school and I watched my friends who had money basically, you know, start to make a career building on the fact that, you know, I suddenly realized that some of my friends had money, uh, which and I did not, and that they were able to kind of, they had that cushion to like take an internship, they were able to, they had connections because they had family members in film, and um, I went nowhere, and after about eight, six or seven years working as a production manager, I just quit the business. I ended up dating um, a film producer when I was 36, um, and at that point I was fixing computers and working a door at a bar, and she was like, I like your writing, you should start writing again. So I started writing, I started to decide to write horror, and um, you know, we raised money for my first film using a, we did self-finance with her money, a $5,000 proof of concept that we did very small. So I can speak to that in terms of micro budget, but it wasn't my $5,000. Um, she had $5,000. Um, and um, you know, we used that proof of concept to go to, you know, quote unquote, real investors. And you know, I made my first film for $400,000, uh, which I think is a lot higher than a lot of other people make their first films nowadays. Um, and um, yeah, so that was, so my route isn't exactly the route of maybe the rest of the panel, which is you scrape together and you get by and you do it. Like, no, I, I um, you know, I needed help. Like, that's what I want to say today is that, you know, I needed someone, my, my, my girlfriend was a producer. She, she had $5,000 on like me to make a rubric concept. Like, I needed that person. Like, uh, Amon told me yesterday a quote that he likes, which was, every artist needs an enabler. Um, and that, you know, that David Lynch allegedly originally said that. Um, and that's just completely true, and I found my enabler. Um, and um, I found my partner, and that's how it worked out for, for me. Uh, I can probably be done now, because that's, that's all I got. No, that's, that's great, that's great. <laughs> Caroline, how did you make your first film? Like, what was your foray into it? Uh, the film that I made before this one, A Feast of Man, was, thanks, uh, was a small, extremely micro-budget, extremely Brooklyn Plays Itself film that I had written with a good friend of mine. And because uh, we were writing this film and we had very limited resources, we decided to kind of write around what we already had. So we decided to write a film wherein she is one half of a pair of lesbian cat burglars that rob uh, people in Brooklyn who live in condos. And at the time, uh, she had a minivan that she had inherited from her folks in Arizona. So. Uh, we wrote a lot of scenes where she's driving around in the minivan, and you know, the minivan features heavily into the plot. Uh, we shot at our friends' apartments. I would do the cinematography some days when I couldn't get someone to show up and operate the camera for me, and um, we didn't really spend a lot of money on it. It'll never see the light of day because I haven't invested in the post-production because it was just such a 
such yeah. a small kind of, I mean, it's been edited, but it needs you know, other things. So um, that was very different from your experience. I just, like, like you said, I was in between jobs, got some friends together, and we made it work. Um, the second film was a little bit different. It's my first feature, um, and it came from the ashes of the film I just told you about and my co-writer Dylan Pasture's first film. We wrote the film together, and we were very fortunate shortly after we had finished the script um, to be connected with John Yost, our producer, who is based near me in Albany uh, and has an extensive kind of filmmaking infrastructure at his disposal in Albany. <clears throat> Sorry, I went to Rayford's last night, so I'm a little raspy. Um, <laughs> So he, he comes from this very kind of fecund community of regionalist filmmakers in Albany. And for some reason, he was just freaking how we were feeling and, and said, I'll produce this film for you. And then the question then became, how do we get the money? So for a while, there was talk of how little can we do this for? And he said, well, that 20 grand. And um, I was like, all right, is that 20 grand like all at once? Or is that 20 grand over like two years? And he's like, well, it depends. You know, like for production, we're going to need X amount of money. It was about... I think 10 grand for our actual production without post. And um, for a time, there was a producer that may or may not have been interested, like an angel investor, and then that fell through. So my plan B, because we had cast the film and we were ready to make it, and I had to make the film for personal and psychical reasons as well, um, and I wasn't about to let this not happen for me, was I went to my bank. And this is a, to take a brief digression through history, um, around the time of Occupy Wall Street, I had been banking with a multinational bank and decided to switch to a small, cooperatively owned federal credit union that's regional to where I live because I felt it was an ethical decision and I felt I could have a better relationship with them. So I wrote an application for a small business loan to my bank. I said I need $5,000 to make a film. And because it was a very small bank, I had the privilege of meeting with the woman who was in charge of the loan department. It's a staff of maybe five people at that one branch at the time. And I said, look, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not trying to open a restaurant or, you know, nobody will give me money to make this movie. I, they, nobody knows who I am. We have some people attached to it, but outside of a very regional cinema milieu, they're not famous people. Um, I'm, an, I'm a nobody, but I need $5,000 to make this movie. And... They gave it to me. Of all, you know, I was shocked. And then, of course, I also um, had um, a credit card that had like a five thousand dollar limit. So things that we needed to buy on credit that I could pay for later, we used the card for. And then we had this five grand. And then I also figured out um, that I could take two weeks time off, paid vacation, because I didn't go on vacation. You either go on vacation, or you make a movie if you want to make movies. First rule: you don't go on vacation anymore. Um, I had two weeks paid vacation around Labor Day. So I got paid while I was working on the film as well. Like I timed it out so that I would have payday uh, like at the beginning of the week and, at, and then two weeks later it was like a bi-weekly. So I got a paycheck that hit my account right when we started, a paycheck that hit my account right when we ended. Um, and I timed it out that way. And then the post-production process was a little bit slower going. It took us two weeks to shoot the film. It took us over two years to finish because I had to pay people in installments. I had to wait. I would go back to work. I would make money. I would get laid off. I'd stop. I'd go back to work. You know, it was like a whole thing. So my road to it was very convoluted, but I guess um, it, it worked. And, and the most important thing about it is that, you know, we were very fortunate in a weird way to be using our own money because it meant that we got to do exactly what we wanted. We weren't beholden to anybody but ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. So you're seeing a theme here, find people that will help you get money um, and or find a bank that will give you money. Uh, essentially find a way to the money, even if it's a tiny bit. It can be 400K, it can be 5K, it can be 20K. Small bits. It's just a matter of figuring out what your story is and what it will take to get it done. So let's now hear from Zach and hear his initial experience and then we'll start kind of breaking this down and what it means to be a director. Uh, Zach? Yeah, so um, after I graduated from film school, I went out to uh, Portland with a friend who was directing, wanted to direct a movie out there. I was the editor on the movie, and I also did location sound. And there was a crew of about five of us, uh, and we lived in an attic in Portland for a month and made a movie. Um, it was called Dance Party USA that premiered at South by Southwest in 2006. And the budget for that movie was $2,000. And I went to South by Southwest, it was the first film festival I'd ever been to, and it was Joe Swanberg was there with LOL, and the Duplass brothers had been there the year before with the puffy chair, 
and it was the beginning of this time when you could make a movie for lit literally no money um, and have it recognized. Uh, and I got back from that and wrote uh, the script for my first film, which is called Modern Love is Automatic. Um, I wrote letters to uh, my aunts and uncles and all my, my parents and my parents' friends that had known me ever since I was growing up, and I said, I'm, uh, I want to make my first feature. Uh, this is like a more serious thing than I've done before, so I need uh, more money to do it. Um, I'm taking any donations you have, uh, but if you give me $1,000 and the movie makes any money, I will pay you back first. Um, so I raised about $7,000 that way, uh, and then around that time I was working, at that time, not around that, uh, I was working for a company that did uh, DVD production, and I convinced my boss that maybe we needed to like buy a camera to shoot uh, like interviews for bonus <laughs> features and stuff, and then that camera was never used to shoot interviews for bonus features, it was only used to shoot the movie that I made, um, and we shot for six months. Um, on weekends when people were available. Uh, so I would literally like figure out what the next location, the movie also had a ton of locations which seems crazy for a small movie but when you shoot for six months you just like find another location every two weeks. Um, and so it had the scope that I wanted it to have and it let us sort of, we would shoot at two or three days at a time um, and in the meantime I would just be saving money and buying costumes and saving money to buy food for everyone. Um, and everyone worked on the movie for free um, and we would, I was also editing while we were going along so we were shooting pickups and reshooting things and rewriting um, while we were uh, shooting which was really helpful um, and then finished that movie uh, and then that premiered at South by Southwest in 2009. 2008? 2009. 2009. Yeah, okay. So. So something is interesting, I'll get to your question in one sec, is that, um, well, let me just survey the audience. Who here has, uh, who wants to be a director? Some of you may not, some of you may just be your brother reasons. Okay, a few of you, okay. And so those of you who want to be a director who already has a script written that you want to direct, okay. Who, who wants to be a director but doesn't have a script written? I guess that's a more important question. A couple of you. So like, I don't know a single person that's gotten into directing unless there's a trust fund involved or some kind of crazy amount of money that has gotten into directing without having the script that they were pushing, whether it's writing, co-writing with a partner in her case or just the script that they've personally written. Like that is your vehicle into becoming a director at least with feature film. You know, documentary is different but that would be more concept, you know, some kind of uh, outline. I'm looking at you, Joanne. But, um, but that's... Were you interjecting? Oh yeah. So that's actually I want to say next. Yeah, yeah. So that's a, a very important first step. Um, and also, I'm just curious. So how many of you? I kind of was getting this as we were going, but how many of you made short films before you made your first like bigger feature? Sort of the film that I made before this one was going to be a short. Then it was a feature, and now it's like it's 47 minutes. So I don't really know what that is. But it didn't get done. I mean, well, it's still being finished. Yeah, sort of. It just sort of like petered out. Yeah. Okay. And then Zach, you made one short before. Is that uh, the one? You so uh, I made shorts in film school for class assignments, and I made a, I made like, I made a movie called Rock and Roll Eulogy in film school that um, is like an hour long. Yeah. Um, okay. And that movie cost a thousand dollars, and we just stole, we borrowed equipment from the school. Yeah. Okay. To make and that movie, um, I made a, I made a, I, the only short I made was a movie whose sole purpose was to finance the feature. It was ten minutes from the script. And I added some extra scenes in to kind of show you what the movie was going to look like, what the characters were going to be like. And so it was basically a sales document more than a piece of art on its own. Like, I never submitted it to festivals. It's kind of like a promotional. But it's, it, I mean, it worked as a short film, but it was just showing you this is what the movie's going to look like. So that was the only short I made. Yeah, and I think this is really important. So, um, one, he had to basically not only... Um, use it as a promotional, you know, like, hey, we're selling you what's on the page, you know, to kind of visualize it. But also it's like, you know, if it was terrible, it would kind of be, yeah. well, maybe it. this isn't the guy to direct this film. You know, right. maybe the script is great, but we have to hire another director. You know, it's, it's also who's proven himself. I think it's also the case of folks who make their own short films. Not only are you sort of proving yourself, showing what you can do with little to nothing, and, and maybe down the line, inspiring investors, et cetera, but also just with yourself, you know, inspiring confidence in yourself, and also maybe screwing up before you make the feature film, 
that really mean something to you. So making things that don't see the light of day, that you're not necessarily proud of, but like it's much better to screw up and uh, have something not see the light of day that, that was less at stake, because I think that's also a big mistake as people jump into that first feature they're so passionate about, it falls apart, and then potentially you never do anything again because it's really demoralizing. The people that you brought on board who spent a lot of time and energy uh, you know, are kind of like, uh, what did we get involved in? And then, that, I mean, that can really be difficult. So I think it's important to like see where these beginnings start um, as before we kind of go forward and talk further about what it's like to be, you know, a career as a director. Yeah. Um, and so did you want to... Well, just about to, the, to speak about the script part for a second, I mean, I'm, a, I'm not a very confident uh, person. I'm a very arrogant person, yet not very confident. And um, I mean, it was important for me um, to have a script that a stranger read and said, I am going to invest money in you making this document. Um, you know, like for me, I needed that as the boost of confidence because I was, I would have been scared that the, you know, like I, I needed that external validation a little bit. Um, and you know, it, it can be important that someone that's not, it, it, it's an important, it could be important that someone that's not like your mom reads the script and says, this is, this is good. You need, you, you need to make this and, um, gives you, you know, gives you a vote that this isn't just you and your own butt. This is like this is this is a story that should be needs to be told or you know is good or whatever. Like that kind of external validation, I think, can be very important. Absolutely. And so you had a question. Let's see where this will take us. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, just talking about like your first feature. Uh, one second. Let's see if they can get that on. Is it up? You want to tr test it? Check. Again? Okay. Um, First features getting into big festivals. I mean, is that you're just making your film and you just submit it, you don't know anybody, and it just gets in and it's like amazing well, success? Or how does, how does that work with a feature film and a festival? I'll tell you what my extremely limited experience is because this is the second film festival that I've been to ever <laughs> and the second festival I've been to with this film. The first one was at another festival in August called Sidewalk Film Festival, uh, which was great. That's where I met you. Incredible um, festival. So, um, in terms of taking a feature to a festival, I don't really know how a lot of other people do it. The way that I did it was we had a film, worked really hard on it. Uh, one of our actors also has been in a lot of other films, which was extremely helpful. Um, so we were able to, when submitting the film to these different festivals, um, we would try to get like what's called a waiver alumni, and I'm not sure if this is like an open secret or not. Like, should I be talking about this? I, I, I was thinking I was gonna do the try to do the honest thing in honor because I like. No, Brandon, fuck. But I, you know, first of all, fuck out. doing the honest thing. Let me tell you something. <laughs> Spending money on festival submissions is very expensive. Right. And if you need money for post production or you don't have a lot of money, then spending fifty dollars every time you roll the dice is not going to cut it. And that's fifty dollars that you could be using to save up to make another movie. Um, what I did, and this is kind of a backdoor way of doing it, but I really like that it worked out, is um, I emailed uh, just like programming at whateverfestival.org or info at whateverfestival.org, kind of blindly. Or if you can see the name of the person on staff, blah, 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 dot, blah, 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 at festival.org, you can kind of guess the format and ask for a waiver. Um, I should also say also that uh, Zach Clark edited my film, and his work has played in some of the finest festivals in this great country, as well as many others. So my rationale was, if you like the films of this person, or if you like the performances of this actor, um, why would you not like my film as well? And I, a lot of it is you just have to send a lot of emails and, and not be afraid when you don't hear back or when you get rejected. I mean, you're gonna hear no a lot, so be prepared for that, but you'll, you'll eventually get there. Uh, I'm gonna answer. I'll answer the festival question as well because I think it's a really good question. But um, just in terms of yeah, festival fees. I mean, festivals make their money. I think on on those fees, yeah. and so you know, and um, but those fees are killer for a director without a trust fund, a director who doesn't have any money. It's fifty dollars a festival. That a year of applying to festivals goes yeah. into hundreds, thousands of dollars, yeah. and you and then to just get rejected over and over again. Um, it's it doesn't a really, feel good. No, I mean, I remember when I was first out of college, I was applying to the Sundance Writing Program, and it was $40 to apply to that, and um, I really didn't have $40 at 22. That was a big deal. And, um, I, you know, so I'm putting my application together, and one of my friends goes, oh, you're paying? They waived mine. I know this guy. 
I was like, fuck you. Uh, and you know, it's just, it, and then of course I didn't get past the first round. And you just feel so dispirited. I was like, that was my $40. Um, and uh, yeah, no, it's, uh, those, but I think your, your method sounds pretty good. Uh, just to try to get waivered at least. Try to get a waiver. Look, my, my very dear uh, mentor in film school used to say to us, and this is maybe not the best thing to, to say to a bunch of impressionable college students, but he used to say, if you want to get laid, you got to ask. And that, I mean, it's crude, but that's been kind of my philosophy in doing all of this. Like when we asked the people who worked on our film to ask, you know, to, to work on it, my rationale was, what the fuck are they going to do? Say no? I've heard no before. It's fine. You know, you just ask and ask and ask again. And that includes the waiver thing. Who knows? Roll the dice. Maybe they'll like give you one. Um, and so, so my answer for the, uh, do you have to know someone to get into one of these festivals? I mean, yeah, talk about Khan because that's a bigger, I don't, I, Zach, have you screened at Khan? No. Yeah, I haven't either. So I'm interested to know how you got in. Who did you? Uh, did you email programming at Cannes? I, I emailed Festival info <laughs> at Cannes. Um, <laughs> dot org. <laughs> um, I, um, during the editing process, uh, we showed the cut to someone who does in fact know people at Cannes. And she watched the cut and she said, this is the kind of film Cannes goes for. And we laughed because we, we're making a $400,000 movie and it's my first movie and it's obviously not going to get into Cannes. But uh, she, you know, she was was confident. I, she believed that it was something that could actually happen. Uh, she's just, I think she just kind of understand, understood what they look for and she saw in the films the sort of stuff they look for. So I then did, I did not get a waiver. I, I did spend the like $85 to submit the Blu-ray, but I, I know she put a word in for us, so I know a real human, that, that was what I knew. I knew a real human was gonna see the movie. Like I don't, it, when you submit to these things, who, who, you, who knows who's reading it, who knows who's watching it, and that's, that's so dispiriting. Like, so the one thing I did know was if Can rejects me, this woman put in a word for me, a real human is gonna reject it. And we got in with like one day's notice. Um, and uh, so that was obviously, you know, completely ecstatic. But yeah, no, it, it is brutal. I mean, I, I, I do not, you know, I don't know, I, I wonder what percentage of films get into a festival with no word like that, with just like yeah, I, think I it's sent it probably zero percent. Right, I, I just I sent an be envelope wrong, but... with a disc in it, and no one knows me from a hole in the wall. It's oh. a big mistake. I would never, I would never ever uh, the major festival submit a film without having some contact within the festival and and having someone recommend it that's not you. Um, I would do a lot of research on that. Um, it's a really, it's a huge thing. But I would like Zach. Well, you can continue if you want. But a, after that, yeah, Zach, no, yeah. just talking about getting into South by, you sure, know, early on. Well, I, um, but Mike, go ahead. Oh, yeah, no, just, I mean, something that was just a little frustrating for me was then when I did press. You have to do press. You have to be friendly to press. They all want to do the article, the cab driver that got into can. And like that's just it, it actually is sending the wrong message. But I, I need the press, I need the promotion. Um, so you don't want to disagree with with the the narrative that makes them interested in writing about you. But it's an offensive notion because it's not true. It's not lotto. Like you know, no someone that knew someone at can saw my movie and thought it was interesting and like put the word in. But he, he, and I didn't you know. I, I just let them write the stupid narrative. I'm like, oh, cab driver got into can. This is amazing. And it's like, uh, you know, anyway. <laughs> yeah, no, that's huge. That's huge. Uh, and I can't tell you how many times I've seen films that's like, oh, the sleeper hit, you know, made with set on seven grand, shot on an iPhone. But then you dig and it's like, oh, the Duplass brothers produced this movie. You know, it's like the, the real narrative is that other, right. you know, it's like, you don't right. hear that unless you dig and, and read all the articles and really find out. Absolutely. So Zach, talk about you starting out early on and getting into South By, which is um, a huge Yeah, I I'm pretty sure, and I didn't make this movie, but Aaron's, Aaron Katz's movie, Dance Party USA, was a cold submission. And then, for some reason, when I made Modern Love, I was like, I don't want to have anyone put in a good, that, like, that's dishonest. I was like 25, I don't know what I was talking about. Um, it's a stupid idea. Uh, but, but Modern Love, I paid money to submit to South by Southwest and didn't have anyone put in a word for me. And that got in. And when we went there, the programmers were like, you submitted really early. We like, a small group of us like found your movie and watched it. And then we would just watch it all the time. Uh, <laughs> that's what they were like. They were like, we would just put on your movie after we watched like five bad movies in a row, just to be like, this is what we're doing, uh, this is the kind of movie we should be championing. Uh, and that was like very lucky for me. Um, I will say that then I made, uh, shot a movie that same year. I'd had a bunch of friends who had 
made movies and then immediately made another movie and had sort of a boosted level of success, you know, that this sort of one-two punch. So I shot a movie the same year uh, that Modern Love premiered, and that didn't get into any of the festivals that Modern Love got into. And it got into this, which was very frustrating at the time, but in retrospect, it found its own separate uh, audience that when I made a third movie, I got to combine those two things. Um, so it is incredibly helpful to know someone. Uh, and I think what Morgan said, just like knowing that a human being took it, or like, knowing that a human being took it seriously um, is important. But it also is like by no means a guarantee. Um, oh, no. You know? no, 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 like, no, no. That's certainly that's by that's no means, especially for major film festivals, they reject things made by people who had movies, great movies that did super well a year or two before. Um, so, uh, but yeah, and also Caroline's advice, the, which I always say to people who are just starting trying to figure out what festivals to submit to, if you look at a festival, look at like the last two or three years lineup, and if you're not basically familiar with the movies they're playing, um, then you probably shouldn't pay money to submit there. We had a question in the back. Do you want to either talk loud or talk into the microphone? Uh, when, as she's walking up, something else that's really demoralizing is that you submit these festivals, and especially if you pay and then you get rejected, you're almost, you're generally automatically put on their mailing list. So not oh, only are you yeah. sad to be rejected, <laughs> once a month you get a mailing list uh, uh, just to be reminded that you did not get in and you're being spammed by them. It's but, salt in the But wound. it's so nice to hit the unsubscribe. Like you're like, yeah, I got you, you know. All right, go ahead, Joanne. Well, you know, since you were talking about festivals, I was just going to ask you, if, um, uh, because I've, I've done a number of the, I'm a documentary filmmaker. Um, but one of the things that we kind of learned because we had no money and we were asking for waivers, you know, for every single one. I mean, we, we asked for a waiver for every single festival that we submitted to and quite a few of them accepted and quite a few of them were like, nope, you got to pay full price. And some people said you could pay half. But, um, but uh, you know, what I hear a lot is what y'all are kind of talking around this idea of a festival strategy and, and also the idea of the kind of programming culture at a particular festival, the types of films that they program. So particularly if you have a feature, um, there are only so many slots for a feature. And I was going to ask if you could speak to your experience or what you've observed in going to festivals or having films and festivals about um, kind of the fit of a particular festival for the film that you've made as well as the idea of having a strategy, kind of a tiered strategy for, okay, th these are the festivals I pretty much think I can get into. You know, it's like, uh, if you make your first feature, unless you're just a total badass, there's no point in submitting it to Sundance in your first round of film festival submissions. So the idea of kind of strategizing, you know, if you only have so much money, if you know you're gonna spend money, how you choose to spend that money if you don't get a bunch of waivers. All right, and let's, let's answer this quick and let's move on from festivals. I want to talk, you know, get more into directing and just really go that, but I think this is important. I think people can learn a lot from this, so let's do it, but then let's kind of like go forward. Who wants to answer that? Uh, I'd say the same basic thing, which yeah. is just like look at, identify like four movies that are like your movie that had, a, had the life you would want your movie to have and see where they played. And the only other thing is there's only like three festivals you can sell a movie <laughs> Yeah. in the United States of America. Absolutely. Um, and I would, I would like discourage looking at like regional, having like a festival strategy for the end of um, making your movie profitable. Yeah, I per forget the profit motive almost entirely. Um, look at the, the stuff if your movie is a, a certain way and you notice that they're picking films that are within a certain budget. That's a big tell. Like, are they really actually committed to picking films that are made independently or are they just going to be a place for movies that have a pre-existing distribution deal to play and get PR? That's a huge distinction. There are festivals out there that actually walk the walk and talk the talk. Indie Memphis is a great one as a fine example. But there are a ton of other festivals out there that, you know, maybe like it's just like a nice town and they just want to have a festival. <laughs> like yeah, it's like those stuff. books that you pay and they publish your poem. Yeah, yeah, it's one of those things where, you know, they're going to program like a bunch of movies with like TV actors and then like maybe they'll pick uh, a $500,000 million dollar film made by someone with a trust fund. You can't guarantee that they're going to pick something that costs literally nothing. So identifying like minds, I think, is the best way to go about it. 
Um, I, I, similar to identifying, um, you're, you're technically a world premiere since you're doing this, so count the world premieres at this festival because what you're going to find is a lot of festivals just programmed from other festivals. Most of most of what's being shown has played other places and the programmers saw it and they're like, oh, I like this one, I'm going to bring it to my festival. Um, if there are no world premieres in the festival, at, or all the world premieres are from like filmmakers local to that festival, um, you, may not, you may not have a high chance of getting it. Like, try to, try to find one that's obvious that through their current slot, through the last year's roster, shows you that they, they are open to programming completely new films from strangers that aren't from the area. Um, and, you know, if it's like all films that like have been at Sundance or whatever that are playing there, you know, you're not, don't waste your money. Um, you know, like, because they're not, you know, it's very unlikely. Yeah, so I think um, what, what is interesting that, you know, sometimes panels take a turn and we're suddenly spending a lot of time on festivals, which is interesting. And it also, but, but, but it's not, it's, it's actually part of the point of this workshop, which is that this is a certain level of director here. And, and, you know, and we're at different levels. But essentially, the more money you have, the less you do as a director and the more you become what is stereotypically known as a director, you know, like the directors who you could name on one hand that you've known all your life, you've known of. Um, you become more isolated and you would and you would ask Spielberg what about that? He wouldn't know what the fuck you're talking about. You know what I mean? Like, um, I hate using him as an example because, I mean, is that even real? I don't know. But point is, it was something that's very, I think, interesting and important is, is like, like for me, for example, it, my idea of what being a director means has changed dramatically over time. You know, from the the first time I made a film, I was uh, alternating operating the camera, the boom, uh, sometimes you know acting in it, uh, locations, figuring out money, everything, like every single thing, um, and then that slowly changes. You know, and so festival submission strategy strategies are certain uh, very important in that. Uh, and I think it's, if you have not made a film yet and you have a script and you want to get into this industry, you need to know all those things. You need to know every single aspect of it and you've got to start somehow and that may mean going on someone else's set uh, and being a PA and, and be, you, know, you may think you're a great director, but you need to go suck it up and learn somehow because you have to learn every single aspect in order to push uh, your film forward. The more money you get involved, like, I would imagine on his first movie that was $400,000, and I know he made a proof of concept first, so he probably learned a little bit more, but he probably did not do uh, one hundredth of the things that I did on my first film. And in some ways, I'm envious of him. In other ways, I'm like, well, yeah, and I learned more than you did, so ha, ha, ha. And I can now also produce an AD for a living in between films, which I'm very grateful for. But I just like, let's talk a little bit about um, the evolution of what it means to be a director. Like what you thought starting out to, um, you know, Zach, for example, in your long career, you know, how that has changed for you now that you're having larger budgets and not making, you know, tiny $2,000 films. Let's start with you, Zach, and then let's evolve down this way. Um, I mean, I'm trying to do less, but Little Sister cost $200,000, and I was the director, co-producer, editor, basically the production designer. And then I also released the movie theatrically myself, because no one else was going to do it. Um, so I, maybe not, I wasn't as concerned about like when food was getting there this time around. Yeah, um, but was, hey, that's a huge... And I like The other thing lot. I did, I went in saying I wasn't going to touch a single SAG form, and I did the preliminary SAG paperwork. But I didn't do any of the on-set SAG paperwork. That was like a, a okay. But I, Does I, everyone know what SAG paperwork is? Um, so... Uh, All right, we'll talk about that later. I've been, <laughs> I've been trying to let go of things, but the things I've made to date are still so small that I... And they're, my movies are also so aesthetically heavy that I feel like I'm it just easier for me if I just go on eBay and buy the set dressing myself rather than having paying someone to find it and then showing it to me and then picking the ones I like. I can just find the ones I like and order them and they'll arrive. Um, so I'm trying, hopefully the next time I make a movie I'll have to do significantly less of those things. But um, like you said, I can do all of them. And I think it's important to know how to do all of them. Yeah. Because then you're you're really what you are you're you're putting yourself in a position where directing is really especially indie film directing is like and it's 
what Mike said, it's like knowing your strengths and knowing where you need support. And I, you know, I feel like I have a really good handle on production design, but don't, I don't want to touch a light or a camera. It's just like not what I'm good at. And so I need those people to be very good and strong. Um, and yeah, I mean that's that's sort of it's sort of about figuring out where your holes are and being honest about your sort of lack of skills and, and then finding the most talented people you can get to support yourself. Yeah, I, I can't stress that enough. Like finding talented people you trust. Like if you're really good at operating a camera and you're trying to get your first movie made, don't go try to find a DP. Yeah, trying to find like you shoot it, you shoot the damn film, and find somebody else who's really good at sound or really good at production design. You know, like making the set look good, whatever that might be. Um, just find the help where you need it, but if you're already strong at something, don't wait around and don't make excuses, you know? Move uh, forward. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add, and then I'll be done, that like, crew selection is directing. Yeah. You know, making sure you have the right people working on your set and that those are the people who are setting the right tone for your set. I try to have a very strict no assholes policy when I make a movie. Very important. It's very important to me. There's um, a lot of assholes and it's like, in the world. Who's, if you have a 15, 20 person crew, your gaffer is just as important to the vibe of the set as the person who's playing the lead actor. Um, and that, that to me is all, like, I also feel like if you do enough of your homework right, you have less things to do when you get to set. So it's tone setting to me. So he so mentioned two things in there. I just want to make sure everyone's on the same page. SAG paperwork is the paperwork that goes to actors. That's the actors union, SAG, Screen Actors Guild. And then a gaffer. Who doesn't know what a gaffer is? Just admit it if you don't. <laughs> All right, you all know what a gaffer is. All right. Oh, you don't. See, there we go. Gaffer is the one who controls the lights. They're the, the lead at light designer and or the one actually tweaking the lights to bending. Um, uh, just something Zach said that I wanted to add, add to because I think it's very important is understanding what you're bad at is n not just understanding what you're bad at, uh, honestly, being self-critical and understanding what you're not good at. Also understanding when something doesn't work or when a performance is bad, like recognizing bad and not just being optimistic and thinking it's all going to work out um, is so incredibly important to make to, to succeeding. Um, and so uh, just uh, that ability, because you know, you have to have this ridiculous uh, ego to think you can make a movie, but you also have to be really aware of when it doesn't work and when uh, and what you're not good at. Anyway. Yeah, I just, I'll then I'll shut up. I'll say one thing okay, based sorry. on what he said. Yeah, I know. That, yeah the, the only way I can figure that I've gotten better at it is that the length of time between when I fuck something up and when I realized I fucked it up has gotten shorter. <laughs> it's not like the day of yet, but one day it might be. Yeah, and we'll let Caroline answer this question too, but I, I, like, that is a really important thing, being able to, to understand where your weaknesses are and to know when you're bad at something. I can't tell you how many times I, in the past, was unable to admit that, and I was slowly beginning able to be more open to that, criticism, feedback. But also people, young filmmakers, come to me, show me their cuts. They want feedback, but then I give them, you know, send them detailed feedback and spend time, and then they instantly start defending the why. And yeah. then I see the cut at the film festival, whatever it is, and it's the same it was, and it's like, you should have cut 15 minutes out of this 20-minute movie, like, no joke. Yeah. And it could have been decent. You know, but you got to listen and get multiple sources of feedback and listen to where the consistencies are. Like, just know that this, the moment you make those cuts or those edits, it's a better movie. And that's incredible. That's so, that you learn so much from, from allowing that in and growing. I, I, I'm sorry, I forgot what the... Uh, yeah, I know, right? It's a bunch of dudes rambling up here. Sorry. No, it's fine. It's fine. Um, a growing the definition of a director, you know? And I maybe started misconceptions. Off, well, I started off doing everything. Like, everybody will. You all will start off doing everything yourself. But in doing everything, I think that's how you learn. It's sort of like panning for gold, where you learn what those strengths and weaknesses are. Similarly to Zach, I do love doing uh, production and wardrobe design. I found that to be the fun part. I don't like to make um, a bunch of food for people when I should be talking to my fucking actors. I don't like to be cleaning up soda cans and soda bottles and shit on set when I should be telling the cinematographer what I want to fucking do. So find out what, you, what, what kind of shit work do you like to do on set. Tack that onto the work you're already going to be doing as a director. In my case, it was shopping for clothes. Big surprise. But it was a lot of fun. Um, 
eventually, though, after having done everything, you know, as you as you begin to pull away at the shit that you don't really need to do or don't want to do, and you come to meet people who like your script, who like what you're trying to get across, you can kind of defer that responsibility, then do it. I think a lot of, uh, a lot of you, if you're already making films or if you're even thinking about making films, it's very easy to be hyper-protective, resistant to feedback. You don't want to change anything. You, know, you want to do everything. You can't, you can't trust other people to not do anything. You get very tight with it. And you've got to just let that go. Um, it is also where crew selection comes along. Dylan and I like to say your vibe defines your tribe. You know, if you are working with people who are not on board with what you're trying to do, they're fundamentally opposed to it, or they just are not committed to it, that's fine. You know, most likely they're working for free. They don't need to fucking be there. You can let them go. But if there are people who are willing to take their precious time and collaborate with you on something, then keep them in your corner because they're gonna they're gonna help you out, and you can repay that favor in turn by working with them and learning something new. Uh, uh, I would say um, uh, yes. I because I started with a four hundred thousand dollar film. The goal was um, I hired the t most talented people I could find that also you know I thought had a style that would work for what I'm trying to do. But the problem is. There, people are then going to fail, or they're then going to not be, be doing what you need. And in every area of the film, you need to be able to jump in and fix that with confidence. Um, like, you know, it, it will not, just having talented people isn't really enough to be like, okay, now I get to sit back. Because you're gonna notice stuff's gonna start failing. And it's in many different areas. It could be production design. It could be your stunt coordinator. I know. I know. I'm saying stunt coordinator. You're like, I hate you. Uh, but um, and you know, you need to be willing to jump in and figure out how to make that work and have some understanding of it so that they respect you to some degree. Um, so you know, it's true even with more money that you kind of have to know how to do everything and have some knowledge about everything just so you can direct um, when when something goes when something when you recognize that something isn't happening the way the way you know that's good. Yeah, I think that um, uh, the next thing I'd like to talk about, and then we'll just really open it up to questions, is is the like the really demoralizing and embarrassing things we've had to do to sustain our uh, uh, careers as directors. So like I've I've made four features. They've all made a profit. They've all been on Netflix or Amazon, or one was in Blockbuster. If that tells you anything, um, and uh, and then an episodic series. And that, like to me, like that's a that's five full projects that I'm very proud of and that I make a living in film. But I've also, like, I go and work on commercials in between jobs. I go and uh, edit for people. I AD, I produce, I production manage, I have location manage for FedEx commercials. I do whatever it takes to stay in this world and be able to pay the bills. Um, but I, I don't fool myself into thinking that it's, it's one thing or the other, um, and and also defining success. I was on a panel at South by Southwest that Mike Ryan uh, had me be on. He was moderating. This was I don't know four years ago or something, Mike. And it was called what was it? Indie success. Who's got it? What is it? And how to? I, I don't remember the full title. But it was a funny because my film got rejected from South by that year, and I was sitting on a panel in front of 500 people. And I was like, well, the first thing about success is that you have to define it yourself and realize sometimes it is failure, you know? Sometimes it is just being able to continue doing what you're doing and knowing that you'll fail a lot. Um, and being able to suck it up and, and push yourself further, right? So I'd just like y'all to talk about, like, in the process of as directing, not necessarily early on, but getting projects going, writing, like some of the other things that you've done to make money, uh, just so people understand the, the glamorous life that is directing. Well, I can say that... Um I'm, I'm considerably greener, I think, than many of y'all at this table. Um, but I, from the beginning, never operated under the assumption that anyone would ever give me a job to direct anything. And then I decided that that didn't matter. And that's when I figured out that I'm just going to have to do a bunch of random ass jobs, <laughs> like get money to make movies. Um, I'm fortunate enough to live in New York where we do have a lot of production. So usually, um, if you're living in a place that has a lot of production, whether it's because they've got tax rebates or they just shoot a lot of things down there, great way to um, make money and learn the business is just sort of like do odd jobs in entertainment. I've done all kinds of crap. I work on a reality show now. I used to work um, for Blue Man Group, the guys with the paint. Um, I've, I've worked as a bike mechanic while collecting unemployment, which is legal in New York, thankfully. We also have a very generous social safety net up there. 
Um, but you know, whatever. You're going to work a job, and you're going to have your nights and weekends that you can devote wholly to your practice. Um, and it's helpful. You know, I have to compartmentalize a lot. I'm not going to go to work every day at 9 a.m. Um, and think, God, I love my job. You know, I've never had to. I've never been able to say that. Um, but it also doesn't matter because, like, my life isn't my job. It's my movie making. You know, you can either go home after a day of work, and God knows, you know, a long day is a long day, and take the time you need. But you can go home after a long day and go, I'm going to ass out and watch some Netflix and whatever. Or you can write. You can work on your script. That's your time that nobody can take from you. So if you're working, you know, 45, 50, 60 hours a week, I mean, it sucks. But if you want it that badly, you've got to find the time for it. Yeah, so... Zach, do you want to talk uh, about? Yeah, I mean, I'm a career editor. I always say that editing is the only thing I've ever done that has paid my rent, um, and uh, which is true. I mean, I, I haven't been able to pay my rent writing and directing a feature film. Uh, and I always describe feature film writing and directing as a hole that I put all my time, money, and emotions into. <laughs> um, but uh, I'm, lu you know, I'm lucky enough to be able to keep doing it. Uh, so keeping it very small is part of how I'm able, how I've been able to keep doing it. Um, and part of the, part of that is that I put all my time, money, and emotions into it. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, this year I've, I've only edited movies for other people. I haven't worked on any of my own stuff at all this year, and hopefully next year. Now I'm starting to basically do the same thing I used to do, just on a slightly bigger scale, just trying to work a bunch on other stuff and saving up enough money so that I can buy myself a little time to put into getting my own stuff off the ground. Um, and the other thing I always like to say is that when I was like 16, I would go to the video store and would go to the cult section and watch these amazing movies by these people that were my heroes um, who made me want to make movies. Uh, I've been lucky enough to meet some of them as an adult, and I've been lucky enough to have some of them see my stuff and like my stuff. Those filmmakers that I loved and admired that inspired me are all either poor or they make their money doing something besides writing and directing feature-length films. And I wouldn't have it any other way. Yeah, uh, Henri Rousseau, the famous French painter, I, I love this fact and I love sharing it with people. For the first 40 years of his life, he worked as a clerk and a plumber. The guy literally dug through other people's shit for a living, but he painted on nights and weekends, and now his work hangs in, in museums around the world. Paul Gauguin, too, you know, he was a, a clerk at a bank. I mean, it's not unusual. There's a long and beautiful tradition of artists having to do things that have nothing to do with their art in order to make what they want to make. And don't be discouraged if you've got to take a job that has nothing to do with it. In many ways, it, like I said, it can be helpful because you're not devoting, you know, how much of your personal energy and heart and soul are you putting into a job that isn't fulfilling you? That's energy that you can devote to something else. Um. In terms of most, I don't know if it's the most humiliating, but I was a, I was the driver for the second unit on Seinfeld. Hell yeah! Uh, I, I drove the van. I drove them around. Um, I uh, I then worked in film production on so many trust fund indies in the 90s as the production manager, and that was where I learned that maybe you know. Like there were so many of these rich kids that were just self-financing their own movies, and they just none of them went anywhere. They just all no, not a single person saw them. Which is kind of where I came up with this idea of you should get your script should be seen by someone else that wants to invest in it or whatever. Um, I I then left working in film because I thought it was actually hurting me creatively. I I, I have a fancy notion of myself as an artist, and I actually thought the attitudes expressed by film crews were so bitter and um, so anti-art and so anti sort of all the lofty things I believed in that I didn't want to be around it. I thought it was poisoning me as an artist. Um, so I just started doing more, you know, cab driving, uh, working door at bars, and I never stopped writing. But um, yeah, no, I, after, I mean, I think it is good to work in film at first and get, find out how everything works. Especially, you know, I, I also went to film school. If you don't know anything about film, you gotta do that, you gotta get some, but, but no, the attitudes, <laughs> Uh, the attitudes expressed by Cruz just were so deflating and so anti-art that I, I, I decided as an artist that I needed to separate from that. Um, yeah, that can kill it for you. Uh, you know, the, 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 the bitter grip. Um, like just, that just like, oh, you have a script? Um, and, like just, and just the general, like, you know, I've seen it all, I've done it all, you'll, you'll be nothing attitude was just, you I know. Sorry, I don't mean to no, interrupt no, you, but I want to I wanna expand on that because there's... Oh, there's so many haters in this business. I mean, look, 
We're all guilty of it. I've been known to hate a bit in my day as well. <laughs> Happens to everybody. But yeah, you're, yeah, shout out to haters. I know. <laughs> I'm with you. But you know what, though? Like, you are going to meet so many fucking bitter people who are like emotional vampires and just like don't want you to succeed. And look, what is success? <sighs> I can't tell you. I feel very successful being on a panel with, with yeah. you guys, but that's, that's uh -oh. another story. Um, you're gonna, yeah, you're gonna meet the grip or like somebody who's like been through a lot of shit um, and will try to like cut you down to size. Um, fuck them, they're just threatened by your raw talent. Just tell yourself that. Yeah. Well, Nobody who is not encouraging, like don't listen to them, you don't have the time. Let uh, them poison somebody else as well. Well, and this is something I think is 100% true that you're, uh, only as successful as other people think you are. Yeah, absolutely. Which is like, but you, you know, when you're like, when you're like, oh yeah, your career, you're like ten-year career in independent film. I have yet, like I said, have yet to pay a single check, like rent check, with money I've made from a movie. But but they play a bunch of festivals and they look really cool and people see that and it does well. Uh, for me, getting things out there in the world and the reviews have been very good. Uh, and that is worth more than the rent check in the pantheon of continuing to make these things. Yeah, I mean, the, the whole point, and we have five minutes left here, so we're going to take a couple questions. Uh, but I think that it's really important to define success for yourself and figure out a way to get your movie done. And the, the last piece of advice I'll give before we get uh, maybe go left field with a couple questions is that uh, focus on your story and the quality of the performances in front of the screen. You can shoot a, that movie with your iPhone and it will get you further places than having a million dollars and having a shitty story and bad acting. No one cares. No one cares how good it looks and how well it sounds if you don't have a good story and good acting. It does not matter. That's the, I want you to go away with that if you go away with nothing else. All right, let's take a couple questions. We literally have four minutes, so we're gonna have to like answer these quick. Yes, so just go ahead and step up to the mic, whoever is ready. We're running out of way now. We have three minutes. Whoever wants to step up to the mic, you can go ahead. Uh, me first, then. Yeah. <laughs> um, what are your strategies, and if you have any successes in the crowdfunding area when you're trying to finance your film? Obviously, you guys are wearing multiple hats, director, producer, probably most of you. So what has been most successful for you? Have you seen, like, you know, a pre-marketing stage and all this? And what platform has been best for you? All right, we have to have 30-second responses. I raised $30,000 on Kickstarter for my third movie, and it was half the budget. And we did that because that movie was never going to make any money, so I wanted money from people who didn't want their money back. All right, who wants to... G <laughs> um, I have not crowdfunded for a project yet, mostly because I feel like with my first feature, I, I wouldn't get any money anyway, because nobody knows yet yeah. what I'm capable of. So I just did it myself. But you bet your ass I'm crowdfunding the next one. Yeah, I have no friends, so doing a, doing a Kickstarter would have just been like asking my parents for money they don't have. Like, okay, we have to donate to Mike's Kickstarter. So, uh, no, I never. I mean, hopefully, you know, in a in a you know, I can make another film, make another film. I have enough of a, I could have a fan base, and that could create you know a Kickstarter that can mean something. I probably have to pay a PR person to promote it though. I mean, like you know, because I'm not like a social networking guy. So yeah, maybe one day. But no, I mean I, as of out the gate thing, unless you're really mm. popular, unless you're like an Instagram star or a Twitter star, like I don't, I don't see. You know, it was his third film that had happened. Like, you know, I think I assume he had a. Base. It was, it was a full time job, and I asked literally every person I've ever met that I still had contact info for. I always say it was worse than making the movie because when I it was more stressful than making the movie because when we were making the movie, I knew we were going, I knew we were making the movie. All right, next question. We have a minute and a half left, so this might be it. Um, hi, guys. Um, I'm a screener for Sundance, and I also read screenplays for The Lab, and I'm also a journalist for Movie Maker. And I just got a vibe, like an antagonistic kind of sense towards programmers and press. And I feel like sometimes, you know, there could be allies to filmmakers. Absolutely. Like, your film was number one in the New Yorker first uh, list of last year. So I just want to get a sense of what is, you know, why does it seem like that sometimes there's a, an antagonistic sense between filmmakers and press and filmmakers and programmers that people think that they don't even watch their films or that, you know, that there's like a, the festival's trying to suck up money from the filmmakers. I just want to get your sense of that because that's from the conversations what I got. I would like to speak to that because I am um, reluctant to pay for the kinds of fees that support the festivals, but I don't think it's an antagonism. I'll be totally straight with you. Filmmakers, film programmers, film journalists, what do we all want? We all want the same thing. We want butts and seats and we want the continuation of the seventh art. Now how we get to that point 
is going to be radically different. Programmers have an obligation to the festivals and to the festival audience to bring things that they want to see, things that will do well, things that will support the festival and make sure that it's possible for another year. Nobody begrudges them that, least of all me. And I understand that more often than not, when a film is rejected, it's not because it's not any good. It's just, look, this is the reality of what we're dealing with. Especially now that there's less funding for these arts initiatives than ever. Um, it's the same with the press as well. Um, so antagonism, I don't know if that's necessarily true. I would just say it's a, a, a realism in terms of the approach. Um, if, you, if you approach this stuff as a filmmaker um, with a realistic understanding that you're not always going to get your way, then it's going to make it a lot easier for you to focus on making your next thing, getting the work done, and less about, oh, my film got rejected. Does that make me a bad filmmaker? My film didn't get written about. Am I a bad filmmaker? So it's not a personal reflection on you. It's just that we're all out hustling for the same thing, you know, just in different ways. Uh, I mean, I, I, I'm going to be actually mean. I, I think festival fees are a vanity press that, uh, that you, the festivals know they're going to take like one film out of like whatever thousand and they're still charging these fees. And yeah, I don't think it's cool. I, th I think like 85, 90, 95 percent of festivals are programmed by people that have an in, that know someone or you know, that are not, you know, these, the people that are submitting cold are just handing money over to these festivals to get rejected. And while maybe I understand it's how festivals have to survive, I think it's kind of messed up. Um, as for anything else adversarial, I mean, you know, re rejection hurts. I mean, you know, if you're a journalist, you don't write about my film, I get hurt. I mean, uh, you know, if, I, if it's a festival, you don't take me in, I get hurt. Anya said yesterday, don't take it personally. And, and I'm sorry, I love Anya, but I immediately thought, Anya, make a film and submit it somewhere <laughs> and get rejected and then talk to me about not taking it personally. I mean, because, you know, easy for you to say. Um, but uh, so, yeah, I mean, there's, a, there's an emotional component to it as well. I have taken it personally in the past, and I'm trying to get better at that. Right. Yes, I should be too, actually. Yeah, yeah I think that's yeah. important. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring it, it took, up. My, it took like three movies. I'm going to bring it up with my therapist this yeah. week. Yeah. Look, so we have to wrap it up. We're getting the eyes and the threats from the back of the room. Um, yeah, I think uh, hopefully all of you who want to be directors will figure out a way to make your movies. And, and have success in that. And just, again, I say focus on your story and by any means necessary, get your damn film made. Don't depend on, don't wait for the money to be there. Don't wait on all these various things. Just make your damn movies. That's it, make them. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for coming. We appreciate it. It was a really great panel.